delighted to welcome Mako Fujimura for our conversation today. Mako is an artist, writer, and speaker. He was a presidential appointee to the National Council on the Arts from 2003 to 2009. He's an international advocate for the arts, and his work has been exhibited in galleries throughout the world. I have here his second book, which is entitled Refractions, A Journey of Faith, Art, and Culture, and it's a collection of essays bringing people of all backgrounds together in conversation about art, culture, and humanity. And then this is his most recent work, Four Holy Gospels, which is an illuminated manuscript of the Gospels. And the paintings that are printed in this copy are on exhibit right now in California. And just most recently, uh, he completed an exhibit at Mobia in New York City. Welcome, Mako. Thank you Thanks. for joining Thanks us for today. I'd like to start with your background. Uh, where were you born and raised? What were your formative experiences growing up? I was born in Boston uh, uh, and uh, was brought up by culturally. I, uh, I was in Sweden for a time and then Japan, of course. Uh, I went to grade school in Japan. And so when I came back to US when I was uh, 13, um, I uh, struggled with English, just just like um, any uh, <clears throat> students coming into U.S. would. And then um, after my wife and I met at Bucknell University, which is not so too far from here, and after graduating from there, uh, with I mean, interestingly a double major, I was a double major in art uh, studio um, and. Um, and animal behavior, um, and I was just a back at Bucknell, and we we were talking about this uh, strange combination. Um, so maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and but then afterwards, um, my wife was getting her degree in psychotherapy at University of Connecticut, so I was there for two years uh, teaching at a special education school, and then um, then we. I received this national scholarship to go to Japan, um, and initially it was for a year and a half, and then it, it, got, an, it got extended to, for me to get my MFA, Masters of Fine Arts, and then um, it, and I ended up staying for six and a half years in a kind of a lineage curriculum that trained me in traditional Japanese art um, methods and practice, and so, um, Six and a half years in Japan, then I was back uh, in New York, um, got involved in many of the things that I, I, I do now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so prior to your college years, you already felt this calling to be involved in painting? You would have um, considered yourself an artist? Right, uh, although I took it for granted. I, I, I didn't realize like you have to actually defend <laughs> the arts, you know. Um, I thought everybody did it, you know. I, I, I had this notion. My, I grew up in a very creative home. My father is a research scientist. My mother is an educator. And they made it very possible for me to assume that, assume that music and art was always part of your life, that, that you, you come home and uh, you could you could do, you, uh, it, was, it was there um, to create something. Um, and so when I went to middle school <laughs> and realized that the, you know, not the rest of the, my friends were not like that, um, it, it, was, it was kind of a revelation to me that, you know, that, and, and then I realized that, um, uh, I guess in college uh, especially, that you really had to fight to make time for your creativity, otherwise it will be taken away from you. So animal behavior, was this to deal with the art world or <laughs> art critics? How did that combination fit together? Well, you know, I, I, my father is a research scientist, so I, I assumed going into college that I, I would be in the sciences, and, then, and I'll do my art part-time. And uh, so I took some studio classes, but then, uh, as, as, as a good liberal arts education would do, I was able to kind of explore all different facets. And um, I, I was interested in ecology at the time and environmental 
uh, science, but there was no major for that. So, so, and, and then Bucknell had uh, this very unique interdisciplinary uh, study of animal behavior, and it combined ecology with uh, social biology with, you know, actual working with monkeys, <laughs> at the squirrel monkeys and snow monkeys there, Japanese macaques. And I was just fascinated, you know, and I, I would go, it was a perfect kind of blend because I would go and sketch the animals mm -hmm. while observing the animals <laughs> so I could, you know, um, and, um, and, and the um, animal lab was located right next to the art barn <laughs> where I, I had most of my classes. So I, I felt like I was being drawn to that you know, right, area. Right, right, right. And then, um, but now that I look back, I, I think it was very providential because uh, the, how, how I think about uh, culture um, uh, has a lot to do with ecology, uh, how, you know, we have, um, been very neglectful of uh, uh, the earth, and we we uh, have done quite a bit of damage. Um, in the same way, we have been neglectful of culture um, as as a place to thrive, um, and and so there's there's this lack of stewardship over culture as well as uh, the environment, and so. Uh, much of what I read back then and I was intrigued by, and I, I was not a believer, uh, a follower of Christ, so, so I, I didn't know the, how to put all of this together, you know, but, but I, I felt um, it was all, everything that I read at Bucknell had led me to wrestle de deeply with, with is issues of culture and humanity and, and ultimately faith. So I want to return to the ecology theme yeah. in a moment, but you, you, did, you mentioned that at this time you were not a believer. Mm -hmm. And so what were the circumstances that led to your faith in Christ? Yeah, um, it was really interesting because my freshman advisor at Bucknell was, was a professor named uh, Robert Taylor who, um, it was basically your freshman writing class, but um, looking back, every short story we read, and we had to write a paper every week, um, it was people like Flannery O'Connor, Walker, Walker Percy, um, and, and, and so many others, um, William Blake, so, so many others that kind of began to fill my imagination <laughs> early on, and then I, I took a, another class and uh, reading the, the Bible, um, it, it, was the, it was a class called Bible and uh, Literature, um, you know, not typical Bible as <laughs> literature, um, and this professor, uh, Michael Payne, who is, who is uh, kind of a renowned uh, scholar in uh, biblical uh, um, scholarship, not from a theological side, from a literature side. And, uh, you know, he, he, he was a, an amazing teacher and um, so detailed. And, and I think, I, I'm not quite sure, you know, where he lands spiritually, but, but he laid this ground um, almost as if um, I was taking a theology class at a seminary. Um, all the historical, you know, uh, the reading of interpretations to, uh, so it wasn't like your typical class in, in, in Bible and, you know, literature. It, it really opened my eyes. And then he also taught a class in William Blake. And William Blake is a fascinating figure when it, it comes to um, uh, interaction with faith issues. He, he was a believer, uh, and yet he kind of went all over the place. But um, his last epic poem, uh, it's called Jerusalem, it's, it's some 400 pages long. Um, I had started to read this, this epic poem in, in, in college, and when I went to Japan, and I had some uh, experiences that really led me to wrestle even more deeply with issues of faith and uh, reality and so forth. 
and I was wading through this vast epic poem of William Blake, and um, at the end of the poem, uh, there's uh, this be beautiful summarization of the gospel. Um, Blake, at the end of his life, really actually came back to his Orthodox faith, and he used Jerusalem as a kind of a template, or maybe maybe even a, a canvas to wrestle um, honestly about all of his questions, and um, you know address all of the issues that he had, and and uh, presumably all of humanity. <laughs> you know, it's a full mm -hmm. long, long discourse, and so I read through this, and at the end of it, uh, there's a passage uh, where Jesus is uh, on the cross, looking up, uh, down at Albion, his, one of his emanations or characters that he, Blake, uh, created as, as, as a symbol for searching humanity. And uh, Jesus is telling Albion, wouldst thou love, uh, love one who never died for thee, or ever die for one who had not died for thee? And if God dieth not for man and gives himself eternity for man, man cannot exist. For God is love as man is love. And every kindness to another is but a div divine death, um, a little death in the divine image. And it's, it's just, uh, it just caught me off guard. I, I was, um, my wife, uh, who grew up uh, in a church, um, had gone through her own kind of a renewal experience, and she was attending the, this this church. Um, and um, I used to just go with her just to please her, you know. And and um, but then I got intrigued by the young missionaries there that that's uh, has very similar background to mine. That they went to major universities and studied engineering or whatnot, and and they wanted to be in Japan to be a missionary, and um, so, uh, you know, they befriended me, and I'm sure they were praying for me, um, uh, and I, so I, I had began to kind of deal with, uh, you know, within worship, um, what, what the gospel was about, but when I read Blake, it was so clear to me that this message of the gospel has not changed. <laughs> You know, all, over all these years, mm -hmm. and I, 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 I studied Zen and Buddhism and Shintoism, and and uh, it was it was given that religions change over time. Messages do, you know, in course of time adapt to the um, to the environment and the culture, and um, it gets syncretic, and and uh, it was kind of astonishing to me that. The, the clarity of the message that was woven through time, through way back, um, of course, through the King James Bible, uh, through Milton, uh, who all, I also studied at Bucknell, and to Blake, to, um, to, to, to now, to these you know, 20th century missionaries then. Um, and um, I, I had to admit that there was something very consistent and intriguing about the message of, of the gospel, the love, sacrificial love that Blake defines through Christ uh, in Jerusalem. This, that love is a, a, a necessarily a, um, sac a transactional sacrificial reality that in order for me to understand love, somebody has to love me first. In order for me to uh, understand, um, w you know, death, in a, in a sense, uh, somebody has to reveal that there's purpose in, in that. And sacrificial life has to be equated with sacrificial death. Like the, the significance and purpose and, and uh, this, this back and forth that Blake defines in Jerusalem is was as, as a clear of a message to me about okay so if i want this love if i want to love my wife then i have to in some ways die to myself that i i cannot do this on my own that if this is a paradigm that i want then um she uh you know as as my wife will love me um 
I, I have to receive love. And it made total sense that I received Christ because he is offering this love to the world and, and specifically to me. I, you know, um, so all this happened while I was reading <laughs> William Blake <laughs> on a cold February day in Tokyo. And uh, I didn't know that I, 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 I be, had become a Christian. I, I just knew that if this is true, then, then I need to know this Jesus uh, more intimately. And I, I, I understood that um, he had sacrificed himself so that I can come to know this love and that God is love. You know, and it just made total sense. And I, I was like, okay, you know, I, I can um, uh, maybe in some ways art has been my God, you know, before this, that I was looking for significance and purpose and meaning through, the, uh, through creating art. And, um, but I, I also realized is, is that that path is very limited. Uh, the more you pursue beauty, the more you understand beauty, the more the beauty will become very oppressive. That is, you, 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 you understand that you're, you don't deserve it, first of all. And if you are creating it, uh, as any gifted person would end up doing, you, um, you're almost, uh, it's unbearable to be able to create something that is beautiful when you don't have a paradigm within to, to justify it. So, so for you, you're there, February, yeah. reading Blake, yeah. uh, all these thoughts yeah. going through your mind, the yeah. Lord is doing all these things. These ideas and realizations you had about beauty, did this cause you to uh, reconsider your vocation? Yeah, or, or, I, I mean, I was, I was, Did you, you want know, to give up painting? Yeah, I, I, I was willing to do anything at that point, and my... My missionary friends, you know, laughed and said, you know, most people start walking with Jesus, and he started running. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like running to, you know, Uganda or something, you know, because I, I was like, hey, this is true. Like, why didn't anybody tell me this? <laughs> you right. know, like, why, why? The whole world needs to know, you know, right. and and I, I need to, um, you know, whatever God wanted me to do. And um, but then um, I had a series of experiences and conversations with people um, that really, um, actually C.S. Lewis, reading Lewis was one of them, um, and realizing that, you know, God didn't put me in Japan in this highly, highly, um, you know, elite program um, for no reason, and that I, I, I had a purpose in Japan. I, I, I didn't know what they were, but uh, you know, um, at the time. But but I realized um, there must be reasons why, you know. And and so I began to ask God, so what is it that you want me to do? And um, eventually, I felt called back into the arts. And there, there are a whole bunch of paintings that I did at this time. It was it's really. Um, Almost, almost difficult to look at because I, I was really, I, wasn't, I was not sure what role art is going to play in my, in my life. And yet I knew that the way I process things, I had to do th things creatively. Mm -hmm. And so I was producing these works that, that were just in between and you know unresolved and just um, all over the place. And, um, um, but I, I think that's what I needed to do, too. So how long was that period of time? About two years. Two years. You're yeah. still in Japan. You're yeah. still studying these yeah, I'm techniques. Yeah, I'm going through, actually, uh, I had just gone through a research program into, I got accepted into the Master's of Fine Arts program. So I had two years, uh, really, to resolve this, mm -hmm. you know, issue. And, and um, there's a painting um, it, it, that's displayed in my uh, first book, River Grace. It talks about this painting that I did for the uh, thesis painting for my master's program, mm -hmm. which really was an emblem of not only me becoming a uh, follower of Christ, but it, it's a journey toward um, uh, art and uh, my identity renewed, you know, that God would call me back to 
understand what I did to glorify um, the uh, glorify God. That was, um, um, and it, it's all in the painting actually. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I write about it in my essay there. So those years in Japan were life changing. There, it, it was. It was absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But by the time you returned from Japan, you were. Uh, confident in the fact that you could reconcile your Christian faith with your calling as a right, artist. Right, right. Which, which was not easy to do back, you know, it, was, it wasn't something that, uh, you know, uh, churches were talking about right. or, um, you know, Christians and Visual Arts, an organization that, that started um, long, uh, I guess about 30 years ago, you know, there, there were about, I don't know, maybe 100 members, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the people who introduced me to this group uh, were connected to other ministries um, of integration of art and faith issues, or theater and art, or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. But like you could basically put, put us in one small room. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, so there, uh, there weren't too many resources that I could tap into, and, um, uh, and yet I, I felt I was very fortunate uh, to be given this opportunity to uh, wrestle openly uh, to to ask questions uh, Francis Schaeffer right. C.S. Lewis you know and, uh, and all these resources were there but but now there's, there's far more resources mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. ever before so you were you, you you felt like in some respects you had to work through these questions on your own that's right and in particular in the marketplace right because when I arrived in New York or in Tokyo for that matter right. There's just nobody else right. who's doing this. Right. So, uh, so part of my uh, impetus for starting the international arts movement was was to find peers, you know, who could at least hold the values, you know. I, and I, I had hoped that initially that this will, you know, that I find you know, Christians who mm -hmm. who operate in the in, in the art world. But I, I soon found out that might be a little difficult so so I said well anybody you know who, who who loves beauty or goodness and truth you know who wrestled with the things that I did I did as a student um, let, let's get together because um, I felt exile really culturally not theologically but culturally from the church um, because you don't find other artists and you're definitely exiled from the world mm -hmm. because they, they do not share the values you know you hold now, now the situation's much different today in yes. many respects. Yeah, uh, la l some yeah. Well, largely through some of the work you've done in international arts movement. And perhaps, other things. perhaps so it's God. I mean, there, there's been a, I, I, I believe, a seismic shift in uh, culture um, of particular New York. Um, sociologically, you can document this. You know, in the past 15 years. Um, it's remarkable. It's it's a revival. Yeah. And um, it, you know and and so all of these organizations, SIVA group, uh, is, 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 if, you, if you go to their conference, it's hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. You know, international arts movement is, is expanding through all these uh, chapters. Um, churches in New York, you know, I was there when I got involved with Redeemer Presbyterian mm -hmm. Church. It was 150 people, mm -hmm. you know, and um, now it's 4,000. Right. So, so this this expansion of God's kingdom has has has, has taken place, and uh, as, as a result, there's, there's far more resources for uh, not only you know it's no longer um, uh, the case that uh, you know it used to be in in the 90s. The fact that you were a follower of Christ and willing to be identified as a Christian. And if you're an artist, it was like an oxymoron. You can't, you can't, you know, like that was impossible. Mm -hmm. So if you're an artist and if you say anything about your faith, you were automatically dismissed from the conversation immediately, you know. Mm -hmm. And I had, I landed in, in that climate, and yet I felt like the only reason why I'm in New York City is because Jesus called me. And so I, I wasn't going to, so, you know, I, I was going to make it very explicit you know, that that the, the the very source of my creativity that I had wrestled with for six and a half years is coming from God, and that it's important 
for not only myself but for others to understand that there is an, a greater paradigm that, that, than, than the paradigm that the art world mm -hmm. can give us, um, that it, it is ultimately freeing for people, that it will liberate them in their imaginative you know, creativity. And, and so at, at the time, there were you know, very few examples of people doing this. And, and my gallery uh, in New York, who, uh, Valerie Dillon, who, founded, uh, who, who found me, um, um, was one of the few people who could um, embrace that. And um, I'm, I'm grateful for, for these people. Now, but recently you said, and I, want, and, I want to, and I want to read this, because I think this is very well put and, and, and may offer a sort of counterpoint in what you just said. Yeah. In my field of contemporary art, the tsunamis of ideologies have washed away beauty, yeah. goodness, and truth in the past century. If you speak of creativity in the MFA crits today, let alone truth, goodness, yeah. or beauty, you will be told to mend your ways. Right, right. So right. The, the situation is still... Yeah, still, still challenging, but, but beauty is back. <laughs> you can talk beauty about is beauty. back. Beauty is back, and, and uh, um, it, it's been back uh, prior to 9-11, uh, but it, it certainly is back now in, in dialogue. You can talk about beauty. You just can't talk about creativity. Creativity is suspect um, because it's, as beauty was in the 90s, it, it, um, it's a term that's been really, um, it's troublesome uh, to define. Um, so you, you have to contextualize it, and if you contextualize it in, in terms of contemporary art, um, it, it's often, uh, which is basically built on irony and, um, um, and, and, and cynicism. You know, so creativity is, is a, something that is to be avoided, you know, as, as this kind of nebulous language uh, that, that we construct to make us feel good about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but I suspect we will be back pretty soon. <laughs> you mentioned 9-11. Talk about 9-11 because you, you've written quite a bit about yeah. that. And it, and it, it yeah. does seem, critics yeah. have noticed this, you yourself yeah. have mentioned yeah. it, that your work was deeply affected, your, your yeah. mind, your thinking was yeah. deeply affected by the events of 9-11, yeah. of course, 3-11 recently. But, yeah. But, yeah. but talk about 9-11 and the effect it had on your work. Yeah, well, I uh, you know, didn't realize, uh, uh, as I look back on the 10th anniversary, really my entire decade uh, was dealt with, uh, um, was spent dealing with this issue. Um, implicitly, explicitly, um, almost every painting that I painted had something to do with walking through fires and um, determined to find a place of hope in the midst of turmoil and, and, and trauma. Um, uh, that, um, you know, I, I, as we were spared that day, a whole family was, and I realized my children had grown up on Ground Zero. They, are, they, they have literally lived through history and not only survived, but uh, came out um, with this creative drive that um, um, I think is, is in some ways in response to that day, you know, that they did not go in, in the direction that um, typical New York student lifestyle would dictate, um, you know, out of competitiveness and, for, you know, climbing the ladder of success. Um, but they all chose uh, some kind of creative path to, um, to uh, both understand the world and, and create something into it that is beautiful, that is uh, compelling, that, that, is, um, that wrestled with deeper issues of faith. You know? And so, so there, there's, there's this um, Significant, significant fruit in their lives, but, but in my art, too. Um, as a lot of things that artists do are very intuitive and unconscious. You know, we don't plan <laughs> to, like, you know, look back many years and we, the things that we see now, we really didn't plan to do at the time. We're just responding 
So that's very true. Um, but I, 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 do, I do think that, you know, I, I wanted to understand what is the role of imagination in, in, in such a time as this? And were there people who went through uh, the dark, darkness and came out with hope? You know? And T.S. Eliot was, was one of them. Um, Dante, another one, uh, whom T.S. Eliot mm. relied on. Um, so uh, there were many imaginative uh, uh, resources that, that I, I could rely on. But um, it, it certainly has been a, a journey that I've been on for the last decade. Making sense of suffering, yes. evil, yeah. a renewed appreciation for beauty. Is absolutely. that a fair characterization Ab absolutely. of what you're describing? Absolutely. And, and, uh, and presumably, why, why, why beauty? You know, and, um, um, and when I was finishing up the Four Holy Gospels project, and I spent two years working on it, um, I, I also realized you know, everything that I thought about, Eliot and Dante's imagine, imagination, um, for Angelicals to um, everything that I've done for this is is very much an encapsulation of w how you go through. You know, 20th century is full of trauma. Uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Darfur. You know, um, the Holocaust, and and uh, um, I think I was when I was doing this because you're looking at it in a 400 year span or even more you're forced to reflect um, as if um, you, you, you know, you see the whole picture of history and, and this little uh, place that you're placed in and how, how does that affect, you know, or how does it link to, to the whole. Do, do the profound and massive evils that we've seen in the 20th century, do those provide us with a unique window on beauty that perhaps would be less easy to see in right. times where we weren't confronted with such yeah, it's obvious only, evil? Yeah, it's, it certainly redefines beauty. Um, does it redefine art? Does I, th art I think have it to does. Be I, 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 think, I, I, think, I think so. That's my conclusion. I, I think so. I think you cannot create the same way after seeing the Holocaust, seeing Hiroshima, Seeing 9/11, seeing 3/11, I don't think you can. You know, I mean, if you, uh, and I think artists will agree with that. They they may not necessarily um, talk about it, <laughs> but implicitly, things did change after 9/11, um, and we and and the ensuing economic turmoil really accelerated that transformation of artists viewing what they do as something detached, more, more or less detached from commoditizing. Of, you know, so so it's, it's not just so that they can be rich and famous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, um, if you're an artist today, you're doing it because you love to, to paint or you love to dance. Um, and that love comes first. And, and so, so in, in that sense, it, it's kind of had a purifying effect. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. On the uh, entire art industry, and 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 it's been it hasn't been easy, but yeah. But twentieth century, twenty first century art, it, as, as you see it, has to be different. Has to be different because right these evils have been so right. obviously. Right, and and I think I think you know it it's strangely linked to theology here. You know, it's 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 something that I think all of us collectively has to. Uh, work towards um, because any kind of cultural efforts are not isolated. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it's not just the artists doing it; it's, it's everybody. Um, so, and I, I think theology has has is central to this conversation. So, what is it about art or theology that needs to redirect itself? 
um, perhaps uh, one area is uh, the area of kind of this utilitarian pragmatism that modernists um, have uh, tendencies have brought on to talking about um, you know usefulness of of what we do as as you know spreading the message of gospel into the world. Um, I mean, what I mean by that is. Um, not that it's not useful, but 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 the way to justify it, you know, um, would would you, for instance, go to a country um, that you can spend 20 years and not see anybody come to Christ, and justify it? You you really can't today, because the church is driven by this mechanism of pragmatism. You know, you have limited resources, and therefore limited time, and therefore you have to be, you have to show me metrics. Well, that's all the result of, you know, modernist tendencies to um, categorize, to create these metrics that you can measure within the limited resource uh, paradigm. And, and now we're realizing that, you know what, maybe what really endures uh, may not be something you can you can measure, um, but something that goes deep within uh, the soul of a person. That the very fact that you can't measure it is, is a sign that um, the Holy Spirit can only touch that that area. That we, it is invisible. Of, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, it works beneath the field, the ground. And, and we can't see it, and it's better if we can't see it. So let's be faithful, you know, rather than successful. That, that whole, um, I, I think that there's a whole conversation to be had. And it's, that pragmatic turn that you've described is going to be the great enemy of art. Exactly, exactly. Because art, art is a, uh, you know, as Lewis Hyde says, is a gift and not a commodity. Um, it is driven by, um, this sense of generosity that we have toward the world mm -hmm. um, and joy. And, and, and um, you know, when we're when we a child, we have this uh, instinctively, but we lose it because the, uh, you know, pragmatism kind of sets, you know, settles in. And I, I think to live generatively toward the future, we have to s start with a different paradigm. Uh, we have to actually a biblical paradigm, actually a gospel paradigm, which is Jesus coming to us for no reason <laughs> other than love. Mm -hmm. he, did, he had nothing to gain except, except me, except you. Because except of his great be, love with be, which he loved right, us. That's right. And that's not pragmatic. <laughs> right. Right. It's right. Not, we're not useful, right. to, I mean, to right. God. So right. why would God do that? Right. <laughs> let me, let me um, ask you about the Four Holy Gospels yes. project before yeah. we run out of time. That, um, what were the challenges there? What were the challenges? Because there, it seems to me, you were trying to serve the text. Yes, yes. Is that, uh, and is that it, was, it was really the first time I've been asked to explicitly connect the text of the Bible to my work. I, I have been doing it implicitly all the time. Right. <laughs> right. And, and you have to kind of operate in that sense. In, in, you know, if you're an uh, artist um, operating in Babylon, <laughs> you know, you, right. you're, you're, you're speaking Babylonian language rather than right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> language right. of Jerusalem. So that's what I'm used to. And here is, was an opportunity. Uh, and what was astonishing was that uh, this kind of commission to a single artist has not been given in 400 years. Hmm. So it's the first time that anybody's been asked to do this, apart from notable you know, exceptions like William Blake or Barry Moser or St. John's uh, uh, Bible, which was recently done by yes. Ben Benedict Time. We just Mark. had an exhibit here at the University wonderful. of the Codex. Yeah, wonderful. I, 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 I met uh, uh, one of the artists, and uh, it was extraordinary. You know, it's really wonderful. But that was uh, done as a collaboration. Right. So, and whether for <laughs> good or ill, I was alone doing this. So I spent two years uh, almost, you know, um, semi-sequestered trying to come up with a visual language that, that is not in existence, really. Um, and, and so I really struggled with 
for everything from how I do this, and, and I did all this research looking at all the manuscripts that's available online and, and in person, from Book of Kells to uh, you know, Lindbergh Brothers, um, uh, French manuscripts from medieval times to, of course, William Blake and, and all the recent manifestations of Bible. Mobia just did a um, comprehensive uh, exhibit, including all the 94 pieces that I did with the uh, Tinsdale to King James versions throughout. Um, but it's so evident if you look, if you go through that exhibit, that um, it, the visual imagery disappears. You know, around the time of Reformation, it comes and goes. But it's it's, it's you you almost cannot mount a visual museum exhibit with just the Bible anymore. Mm -hmm. You could before, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know. So that something happened. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I was never the one to, you know, say, oh, you know, there's something wrong with us. You know, we have to have images in the Bible. Um, but uh, wh while I was doing this, I did realize that um, what my friend kindly called this visual theology has to be developed. Uh, just as we have, you know, we apply the, the gospel into all of life. Um, so it's somewhat amazing that there has been an effort to create a 21st century or 20th century language that uh, corresponded with illumining the Bible. Uh, because that, that means that we have not been able to engage this entire population of Christians who are visual thinkers. <laughs> right. That means that we have kind of almost pushed them into the margins and saying, it would be nice you know, if you can just draw something for the bulletin or design a logo, right. but never really asking them to be part of the interior core of worship, um, which has always been that way, <laughs> you know, from Solomon's times. I mean, from, from Genesis, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's that way. Um, so there was a, this void, you know, that I fell into. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and I had to somehow uh, come up with my own interpretation. But I say in the preface that it, it is my ambitious prayer that uh, this little effort will, will, will um, ignite something for the larger Christian body of Christ to you know, start to think about challenging more artists, challenging more people to respond visually to the text. And hopefully that will happen. The text of scripture influencing all of life, all of life. Including, including the visual arts. Including the visual arts, yeah. What do you do next? Well, I'm, um, I'm, Judy and I have uh, been thinking about what our lives would look like, you know, after our kids went off to college, and uh, we decided, uh, starting around five years ago, that um, ground zero residence that we have is no longer functioning in the way that it used to be as a as a point of contact with people. Um, that you know, ground zero kind of became this commercialized uh, arena um, and. Uh, place where you demonstrate rather than, you know, when you reflect. And, and so, uh, so I am thinking right now building a larger studio near Princeton and uh, starting a small institute under IAM that deal with the synthesis of art and faith and even sciences, as my father is a scientist, and um, I want to honor his legacy. Um, and, and even business, as my brother is an entrepreneurial business, a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, and um, he's funding most of it, so <laughs> I want to honor him. Uh, but um, I, I think uh, this is a small effort to really go back to the guild system of, of um, you know, uh, medieval times when, when you, you know, you could have people being trained um, to learn the technical aspects of things, but furthermore, I, I, I really want to help, um, uh, you know, mentor young, younger artists to be able to synthesize um, all the, you know, complex realities of today and to, to do what, what they are called to do, 
uh, whether it be art or whether it be pastry chef, uh, as one of my assistants became a pastry chef. <laughs> Very proud of her. <laughs> and, um, and also, it, it could be teaching, it could be anything, but uh, you know, um, that, that's uh, what I'd like to um, uh, s s start to create. So. Mako Fujimura, thank you very much yeah, for your thank time. Thank you. Thank you.